When you think of art, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Do you think of music? Of the great American novel? The movies? I bet that you don't think of this. It all began on October 20th, 2005, when Pulitzer Prize winner and noted film critic Roger Ebert had to review a movie. That movie was Doom, starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Carl Urban. Doom was based on the blockbuster 1993 first-person shooter. Today, first-person shooters are more popular than any other video game genre. The multi-billion dollar Call of Duty franchise serving as the industry's poster child. The objective in Doom is this. You are a space marine affectionately nicknamed Doom Guy, who must avenge the death of your pet rabbit Daisy by traveling to hell and unleashing your wrath upon hell's minions with very big guns. You collect keys to open doors, search for the stage's exit, enter a new stage, shoot more demons with more big guns, collect more keys, open more doors, lather, rinse, repeat. The perfect premise for a major motion picture. Despite a modest opening weekend of $15.3 million, Doom the movie fell short of its $60 million budget and was universally panned by critics and audiences alike. Of course, Roger Ebert was one of Doom's many critics. After writing a scathing one-star review for the film, Ebert said, As long as there is a great movie unseen, or a great book unread, I will continue to be unable to find the time to play video games. Ebert's implication was nothing new. In fact, it echoed the well-regarded and well-accepted opinion that video games were an inferior medium to the higher art of movies and books. Ebert further added that video games, by the nature of the medium, were structurally incapable of moving beyond craftsmanship to the stature of art. Film and literature, Ebert would say, were simply better uses of his time. At TEDx in 2009, Kelly Santiago, co-founder and former president of That Game Company, presented an argument for video games as art. Using examples from various games, including her company's own flower, Kelly declared that not only could video games be art, but that they already were art. She compared the evolution of games to art with the evolution of cave paintings, and stated of video games, They will become more powerful in the 21st century than radio, film, and television combined over the course of the 20th. She also used a definition of art cited from Wikipedia. Not to be Web 2.0 bias, but I do find that Wikipedia has a really great explanation. Roger Ebert was not impressed. He retorted with the article, Video games can never be art, in which he called Santiago's examples pathetic, and harshly stated that no video gamer now living will survive long enough to experience the medium as an art form. I'm sure you can imagine the sort of intelligent and rational response Ebert received from the internet community. Finally, after Ebert endured all that he could, he forfeited. 
In the article, OK Kids, Play On My Lawn, Ebert conceded that he was no expert of video games. What I was saying is that video games could not in principle be art. That was a foolish position to take, particularly as it seemed to apply to the entire unseen future of games. This was pointed out to me maybe hundreds of times. How could I disagree? It is quite possible a game could someday be great art. The backlash Roger Ebert received should not have been surprising. Video games have emerged as a rival to film and television. They rival in the world of popular culture. Hey, Conan here. Uh, as you probably know, I don't know much about video games. I don't even particularly like video games. I never play them. And for all those reasons, I've decided to review them and rate them. <laughs> oh, this is Greninja? Who's Greninja. Pokemon. Now that's a scarf, but So it's these also... are all from different games? Yes. yes. Quick, who was our second president? Uh, who was our second president after uh, Washington? Uh, Benjamin Franklin? He was a president. He was never president! You know all this Just... shit! <laughs> No, 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 it was, uh... Quick, what's his name? Uh, I mean, he's a villager from Animal Crossing. And who's that? Uh, that's uh, from Fire Emblem, that's Marth. Okay, America just lost. <laughs> so is that the end of the debate? Ebert, by his own admission, didn't play video games, nor did he have any desire to. Was this just the case of an old crankpot out of touch with current events? He was around the entertainment industry for decades longer than Kelly Santiago, and he was a bit of a pop culture fan himself. And I think it may be the best superhero movie I have ever seen. Perhaps he only gave in to an exhausting debate that he felt would go nowhere. His opinion should not be so easily dismissed. Finish him! As ABC's Bill Greenwood reports, there was a growing concern on Capitol Hill that parents who buy some of those games may not realize just how much violence they're getting. Seemingly since the invention of video games, there have been just as many detractors as gamers. About 80% of the people in America that hear me are go, oh, geez, here's a crazy conservative on TV screaming about the dangers of video games. But like it or not, here's the point tonight. We are training our kids to be killers. Video games are often condemned as the corrupter of youth, turning children into slackers, killing brain cells, and being needlessly and mindlessly violent. <sighs> Maybe that last one has some merit. <laughs> Certainly, if video games are art, there must be some sophistication in the themes depicted in these games. So I speak for all gamers when I say the media should stop talking to critics like Anita Sarkeesian. Here now to be talked to is media critic and creator of the web series Feminist Frequency, Anita Sarkeesian. Ms. Sarkeesian, thanks so much for being on here. Let's call this what it is. You and the other feminazis in the gamer world are coming for our balls to snip them off, put them into a little felt purse, and take them away so we have to play your nonviolent games, right? No. Misogyny is another criticism video games often have to defend against. Women in these games are seen as nothing more than the object for the male character to rescue. Please save me! The cage is locked with a key. The dragon keeps it around his neck. To slay the dragon, use the magic sword. Women are also frequently sexualized and objectified in games and many of the male heroes the player controls are one-dimensional alpha male stereotypes. Their character traits usually consist of be angry, yell, you defy the god of war, and yell louder. You and your tower and all this fucking emotion can go to hell! However, while these negative traits do exist in certain games, they also exist in many other types of media. There is an entire subgenre of films that are devoted to exploitation and women are often objectified on the big screen. It's unfair to assume that all gamers, and only gamers, are desensitized bloodthirsty zombies. Manhunt 2 is a game that exploits its violence, yet it didn't sell very well, and reviewers panned the game for both its unsettling content and poor gameplay. Many violent games aren't simply gratuitous. Just as in movies and television, violence can be used as a tool to tell a serious and mature story. 
punches aren't pulled, but the violence isn't glorified either. These games earn their graphic content because there is substance and care put into the execution. I... I killed a man. <laughs> Furthermore, not all video games succumb to negative depictions of women. Well, well, well. Guy Brush Threepwood, you do turn up in the strangest places. Uh, hi, Elaine. Uh, do you think you can help me out? Games like Beyond Good and Evil, Mirror's Edge, and Metroid treat their protagonists, Jade, Faith, and Samus, as action heroes. These games aren't marketed to any particular demographic, and the Metroid franchise is one of the most respected and renowned gaming franchises on the market. The Walking Dead, an adaptation of the Image comic book series, treats its depiction of both violence and gender roles a bit more maturely. Clementine's character is a remarkable piece of writing, video game or otherwise. He's just always blaming me for stuff. Like what? Putting a bug on his pillow. Did you do that? Yes. If only for the fact that she is an eight-year-old character who is not obnoxious. Yippee! The player begins the game by controlling Lee, who is Clementine's guardian and mentor. And as Clementine grows in both age and character, the player eventually takes over the control of her. Clementine is often put in grave situations and forced to make difficult decisions. She doesn't just earn the sympathy of the player because she is a child in a desperate world, but because she is resilient and relatable. While originating as a comic book series, and then later being adapted into one of the most successful TV shows of all time, some would even dare to argue that it is Telltale's episodic game series that represents the highest quality of this widely popular series. Take us back, oh, take us back, oh, take us, take us back. condemn all video games as meaningless, harmful, and tastelessly violent is to condemn an entire medium based on the sampling of a few bad seeds that dominate the news. I mean, it's almost like violence boost ratings or something. Oh, boom shakalaka! There's Aaron Boone to lead off. His first at bat of the game, there's a fly ball deep to left! It's on its way! There it goes! And the Yankees are going to the World Series! Video games may have only been around for a few decades, but games have existed for centuries. If video games are art, where is the line drawn with games as art? Most would find it silly to call baseball, football, or even a game like chess art. I mean, how could I say that a game as elegant as chess, with, with elegant mechanics and strategy and metaphor, how could I say that that's not art? Well, I think we have to draw a line between appreciation and Art. They're competitive events with structural rules, yet it takes great skill and strategic fortitude to play these games, whether physically or mentally. Video games are no different. There are rules and goals, winners and losers. And it takes skill and strategy to master these games. So why does the argument of games as art end with video games? If chess and go arguably the two greatest games in history, have never been regarded as works of art, why should Missile Command? Are digital games somehow privileged, somehow more artistic than analog games? Or does the fact that video games are now almost as big as dog food somehow entitle them to a free museum pass? Perhaps the confusion is in the name itself. Video. Game. As video games continue to evolve, calling it interactive media may actually be more accurate. Here's my partner Bill, and then I, we're going to play ping pong for you in a minute. Well, here we are, playing ping pong when we ought to be working. Here's our ball, volleying back and forth, uh, one free ball. Plus one at courtesy of a local CATV station. 
It's true that video games began under the constraints of crude technology. Early games were limited and often featured basic objectives. As the tech grew, so did the sophistication of the games. New consoles allowed for better visuals and sound. Greater memory allowed for lengthier game experiences and for voices. Oh, I suggest we visit the town first. How about it, Your Majesty? That was too close. You were almost a jibble sandwich. <laughs> You're right. Eventually, games began telling their own stories. Maria? You said you took everything, but you forgot that videotape we made. I wonder if it's still there. Mascots and fleshed out characters were created to attach players to the story and to make them invested in the outcome. Video games are made in a very similar way to animated movies. A group of artists and designers begin with storyboards and concept art. The game world is designed from the ground up using some form of game engine. necessary, actors are brought in to record voices, or even to act out using motion capture technology. Music is scored just like in any movie, and only when all of these elements are put together is a game finished. However, do all of these aesthetics combine to elevate video games to an art form? We come back to our good buddy, Roger Ebert, who, if you recall, stated that video games were structurally incapable of moving beyond craftsmanship to the stature of art. What is the structural reason Ebert was referring to? My son is dead, Mr. Shelby. I have nothing more to say. That would be player choice. You may know something that could help save other people's lives. I was unable. In Ebert's mind, the second you were given the option hey, of manipulating the world, changing its outcome, you lose authorial control. I don't care what reason you had for doing it. No reason to go and tell my girl she's gonna end up dead. On top of this, some games incorporate a morality system as a mechanic. Tally's achievements are the only evidence you should need. Come on, Tally, we're leaving. The world of Mass Effect doesn't just change based on the player's choices, but also on who the player chooses to be. Commander Shepard, Kalisa bent seen in Al Jelani. Isn't it true that you were on Earth when the Reapers attacked? How do you justify running away while millions of people on Earth die? Is that the best we can expect from the Alliance? I came to get help for Earth. For everyone. How do you justify running away while millions of people on Earth die? Is that the best we can expect? I've had enough of your tabloid journalism. It is true that some games offer choices that diminish the authorial control of the story. However, does that really diminish the artistic vision of the game developers? And, and what of games that tell linear stories? The player may have a control over the character, but no say in the outcome. The player is witnessing a fully authorial narrative in these games. God. Beyond just visual aesthetics and design, great art resonates with its audience. Come here, come here. 
Hurry up. Come on. It is impossible to discuss art without discussing the emotional significance of art. People often cite great paintings, music, and even films as inspirational or meaningful to them as individuals. But it doesn't take much to see that the problems of three little people don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. Someday you'll understand that. No, no. Is looking at you, kid. Can a game resonate with people in the same manner? Certainly, we feel a huge thrill if we win a competitive event. We can also feel disappointment if we lose, even if it's just when we're watching our favorite teams from afar. But the emotional resonance of great art is something deeper than that, something even more personal. And perhaps this is where video games have the potential to separate themselves from other types of games. In 2009, Academy Award-winning director Steven Spielberg offered his two cents on this matter. So far, the video game industry has not allowed us the opportunity to cry because we're too busy putting our adrenaline rush into the controller. There's no room for a video game to break your heart. Let's travel back to 1997. More than 200 animators and programmers. A multi-million dollar production. Over two years in the making. And a cast of thousands. They said it couldn't be done in a major motion picture. They were right. Final Fantasy VII. PlayStation. During the development of Final Fantasy VI, series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi lost his mother. Life exists in many things, Sakaguchi said. I was curious about what would happen if I attempted to analyze life in a mathematical and logical way. Maybe that was my approach in overcoming the grief I was experiencing. This idea came Final Fantasy VII. Final Fantasy VII was a game unlike anything that had been seen on a home console up to that point. Working with a then-record $45 million budget, Sakaguchi and his team delivered a product with epic scope. It touched upon deeper-rooted themes such as corporate corruption, poverty, environmental issues, life, and loss. Final Fantasy VII was one of the first true instances where a video game, marketed properly and with a wide release, was able to elicit an emotional response from its audience. Story isn't the only way to incite a feeling from the player. Video games have the luxury of using gameplay itself to convey emotion. Don't worry, Dad. We'll be all right. I just wish all this didn't have to fall on you, Alex. Your mother would be so proud. Dad. Dad! Gordon! Help! Ah! Dad! Alex! Dad! So, okay, video games have the ability to stimulate emotion beyond that of a competitive nature. This does separate video games somewhat from traditional games, but does that by itself elevate video games as great art? Of course, it isn't quite that simple. Many people seem to share Barker's belief that the function of art is to elicit emotion, to make you feel things, to move people. Let's quickly dispose of this. Brian Moriarty 
Giardi studied English in college. He became a game developer in the mid-80s and is now a professor of interactive media and game development at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. Unlike Roger Ebert, Moriarty actually plays and enjoys video games, so it may come as a surprise that on March 4th, 2011, at the annual Game Developers Conference in San Francisco, Moriarty presented an hour-long lecture in defense of Roger Ebert. This is an apology in the sense of a Greek apologia, the systematic defense of an opinion or position. It's a defense of Roger Ebert. His apology to Ebert lies with one specific point that Roger makes, one that neither Moriarty nor Kelly Santiago could find an argument for. No one in or out of the field has ever been able to cite a game worthy of comparison with the great dramatists, poets, filmmakers, novelists, and composers. So if both Moriarty and Santiago concede that video games do not compare as great art with these other, seminal works of art, where does that leave video games as a whole? And for that matter, how exactly is great art different from art? In his lecture, Moriarty differentiates the two as art being an artifact, or a craft, and great art as being fine art, or as he calls it, sublime art. Art that deeply rewards a lifetime of contemplation. Art that's good for you. The kind of art that, in Ebert's words, makes us more cultivated, civilized, and empathetic. This applies to all forms of art, including film, Roger Ebert's most cherished medium. And when asked of his opinion on movies as art, Ebert's response was that hardly any movies are art. I have to go. I have to. What did I say? Oh, no, it's not you. What? It's the Jimmy Chungus. Ebert isn't even the first film critic to have this stance. Here's what the late Pauline Kael wrote about the relationship between movies and art. Listen carefully. Quote, there is so much talk now about the art of the film that we may be in danger of forgetting that most of the movies we enjoy are not works of art. Movies are so rarely great art that if we cannot appreciate great trash, we have very little reason to be interested in them. Art is subjective and nearly impossible to define. Contemporary ideas of art, as Moriarty puts it, have become more focused on novelty value. The term for this commercialized type of art, Moriarty tells us, is kitsch. Webster's Dictionary defines kitsch as something that appeals to popular or lowbrow taste and is often of poor quality. However, modernist writer Herman Brock and philosopher Thomas Kolka would argue that kitsch is not necessarily bad art. Rather, kitsch is product art, pop art. Kitsch painters were commissioned. Their works resemble sublime art, but were made to put food on the table. The ideas behind kitsch are simplistic. As Thomas Kolka says, kitsch is highly charged with stock emotions. Blimey. No! Kitsch consists of basic themes such as good versus evil, love versus oh, hate. Fill these with water. Please. As you wish. Hello. My name is Inigo Montoya. You kill my father. Prepare to die. It tells you what you should be feeling at any given moment. Joy. Sadness. Excitement. Fear. Tells you when to laugh. Hey, guy, Sam. Can I keep his head for a souvenir? Oh, come on, let's get down. Come on, everybody. Check me out. I'm dancing. I'm dancing. And when to cry. So silent. Zero. No violence. But inside my Our mass market culture is so thoroughly and 
imbued with kitsch, it's the only kind of art many people ever experience. Broadway musicals, theme parks, casinos, rock stars, cable news, all kitsch. All advertising is kitsch. All media driven by advertising devolves into kitsch. Sequels, spin-offs, knockoffs, reboots, and adaptations from other media are automatically kitsch. Politics thrives on kitsch. And Roger Ebert has spent over 40 years in dark theaters sitting through thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of shameless Hollywood kitsch. As Moriarty says, kitsch is a staple of our culture. You may have even experienced kitsch recently without even realizing it. Video games emulate the kitsch they see in popular movies. And now some popular movies may even be emulating the kitsch they see in video games. Oh yes, sir. I, I feel so lucky that you happened to capture my ship, then murdered me and everyone on board. <laughs> kitsch can be incredibly well produced and executed, too. It can be engaging, entertaining, relevant, and meaningful. Some kitsch have even won some prestigious awards. Final Fantasy VII is a game with substance. It's also filled with stock emotions and is pure escapism. It is a world designed to allow the player to get away from their day-to-day -day activities, not one designed to enhance our understanding of the world we inhabit. This doesn't mean that you can't debate that video games, or should I say, interactive media, aren't or don't have the potential to be sublime art, but you certainly can't debate that they're the product of an industry. An industry's main purpose is to make money. What might a completely personal, interactive experience, not fueled by financial gain, even look like? He won't stop crying. I don't blame him. He feels miserable. I hate that we're here. I hate that he's sick. I just want him to feel better. Game developer Josh Larson and programmer Ryan Green are currently at work on releasing their game, Bat Dragon Cancer. The game is funded both by the team and by donations from supporters okay, of the project, Josh. but this is an entirely intimate work. Bat Dragon don't. Cancer is the story of its programmer, Ryan Green, and his wife, Amy. It retells their real-life experience of raising their four-year-old son, Joel, during his third year of fighting terminal cancer. At 1.52 in the morning on March 13th, 2014, while that dragon cancer is still in development, Joel Green succumbed to his disease at the age of five. Whether or not you would consider this a work of sublime art is entirely up for debate, but in the grand scheme of things, it hardly seems important, doesn't it? Which brings us to the final point. Why is it so important for us to validate one of our favorite activities as sublime art? After all, the existence of video games is no longer in need of justification. The gaming community has grown throughout the world. Video games now surpass movies and music in revenue, and the average age of the first generation of gamers is in their early 30s. They have careers, husbands, wives, and even their own children. Monday at work, huh? They're now the decision-making generation. Video games are mainstream. They've already won. 
Stereotypes such as this are a relic of the 20th century. It's no longer uncool or embarrassing to let that person you've had your eye on know that you like to play a game during your off hours. After all, haven't you heard? Nerds are in this year. And so what if video games are escapism? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with taking a couple of hours off from reality once in a while. Just as long as you make your way back after you've put the controller down. Kindness is something I don't want or need. The sunshine would just dissolve me into light. If something brings you joy, the rest is just semantics. Yes! Would calling Super Mario Brothers sublime art really make it any more gratifying every time you defeat Bowser? And does it make it any more aggravating every time that you find out the princess is in another castle? Would it make it any more exciting to discover that secret treasure in The Legend of Zelda? Any more thrilling when you come face to face with Count Dracula for the very first time in Castlevania? Die, monster! You don't belong in this world! Or any more awe-inspiring when you take down a colossus in Shadow of the Colossus? <laughs> Certainly, it wouldn't make it any more confusing when you encounter Psycho Mantis in Metal Gear Solid. I've got it! Use the controller port. Plug your controller into controller port 2. If you do that, he won't be able to read your mind. It's okay to be passionate about something that's meaningful to us, but there are so many bigger issues, so many more important events that we experience over the course of a lifetime. Is it really necessary to make a fuss over our fun time? So maybe instead of trying to label video games this or that, we should be more focused on just letting them be what they are. A whole lot of fun. And that is truly sublime.
barrel roll. <laughs> 